Pavers by Ideal is, is really a trademark of, of Ideal Concrete Block. Uh, and uh, Ideal is a fourth generation company. We were started in 1923. Uh, we are a Massachusetts-based manufacturer of concrete products. And in fact, one of the, uh, the first companies in the United States to produce concrete pavers in 1975. Uh, we are a member of several national organizations that are leading the way in developing technology on permeable pavements. Um, and in fact, this presentation includes information developed by ICPI, which is the Interlocking Concrete Pavement Institute, as well as the Low Impact Development Center, uh, and research conducted by universities, public agencies, and organizations uh, throughout North America and internationally. Uh, I uh, intend to touch very briefly on some of the issues of stormwater runoff, uh, the objectives of managing it, and then evaluating some of the solutions you have uh, with the porous pavements. Uh, Drilling down more specifically into the design consideration and elements of uh, permeable interlocking concrete pavements, including the construction, maintenance, and costs. Uh, and of course, this is all being driven by stormwater uh, and the pollutants that it is picking up off the pavements as rain falls. And the conventional method of dealing with it has been uh, pipe and conveyance through catch basins. Uh, as you know, catch basins, however, do not treat the water. So the water is going untreated directly into the receiving bodies. Uh, this is being exacerbated by the uh, development and in, in the amount of impervious surface in terms of structures and pavements so that we are increasing the, the volume of water that is, that, that is occurring. Uh, through impervious surfaces, some cases causing flooding, and other cases causing uh, drought situations because water is not being recharged on the site. Uh, therefore, the objective of stormwater management by uh, many of the agencies and, and design professionals is to retain and infiltrate stormwater, capture that first flush, that first half inch of rainwater that uh, has the majority of pollutants in it, uh, limit the amount of impervious cover. Uh, one of the mantras obviously has been to try to imitate pre-development runoff volumes. And in some cases, for many older cities and towns, it would be uh, to try to accomplish a design to uh, uh, facilitate the drainage system capacities which may be at near capacity. So depending on the audience, whether you're a city or town, a design community or an owner, permeable pavements really can address all of these approaches. Uh, porous pavements as we know them uh, really are a component of a treatment train of LID uh, practice. Uh, they're highly effective in providing infiltration, detention, and treatment of stormwater pollution, and uh, they're designed to allow uh, infiltration of stormwater through the surface into the soil while providing a dependable walking and driving surface. Now, the term porous pavement is broadly used to uh, describe asphalt, concrete, and unit pavers, and while they are often lumped together uh, with little or no differentiation, uh, there are some important uh, differences with regards to installation, performance, and maintenance. Uh, we break it down into two types, monolithic and uh, individual units. Under the monolithic uh, would fall, uh, of course, pervious concrete, and asphalt is known as porous, porous asphalt. Uh, both are a modified mixed design where the permeability is typically accomplished by uh, reducing fines within the mix, and they are transported into to the drop site in a wet condition where they are placed and cured in place. Uh, typically, they require train crews as they're a bit more challenging than your conventional concrete and uh, asphalt. And uh, because of the workability, generally prohibited uh, from installation from 
uh, November 15th through March 15th, at least in the east uh, where we are from uh, in the colder climates here. Uh, asphalt has, uh, in the warmer summer months, has a tendency to melt down somewhat and uh, both require a rather rigorous um, uh, maintenance protocol to keep them clean and infiltrating. Typically, uh, a uh, hydrovacking regimen of two to four times per year. Uh, permeable interlocking concrete pavements uh, are comprised of a layer of concrete pavers that are placed tightly together uh, into an interlocking pattern over a bed of uh, crushed stone. Uh, the difference is permeable pavers themselves are not permeable. Now, uh, let me just qualify that is there is a very small percentage that are making uh, them with concrete that is, but for the majority, and I would say over 98% of the permeable pavers that you would uh, use would be non-permeable. Uh, they are molded with a notch design that creates a series of voids across the pavement surface. And these openings and uh, joints between the pavers are designed to funnel water between the units into a layer of uh, coarse stone sand that they are set on uh, and over gap graded stone where the water will uh, be captured and uh, held before it slowly drains away through the soil. Now the opening size of these pavements, uh, as Richard and I, uh, Richard mentioned earlier, is not a 50% that you may see, say, on a traditional grid paper. The opening size ranges typically from 8% to 14% of the surface. Um, that uh, means, however, that it's not that it is 92 or, say, 86% um, solid where you would have runoff. Uh, these pavers are considered 100% Pervious, and that is they are capable of draining hundreds of inches of water per hour through the surface. When we look at the permeable pavement as a system, when we look at the setting bed, the base, uh, the industry, that is the uh, interlocking concrete pavement industry, has uh, agreed to an average of 100 inches per hour as the average infiltration rate. Now, we know that over time, uh, infiltration will diminish uh, because of clogging. And uh, the industry uh, uh, average is saying that without maintenance, the uh, infiltration rate will diminish by as much as 90%. That leaves us at a 10 inch per hour rate, which uh, certainly is more than enough to accommodate most rainstorms. Right. It's interesting, yeah. and we'll look at this as we uh, go forward a little bit, that the majority of the clogging with permeable pavers occurs in the uppermost one inch of the voids that you see on the screen here. Uh, and therefore, it is accessible to sweeping, or if it's totally clogged, can easily be cleaned, removed, and replenished with new material. Larry, can, uh, yes. can you hear me? Let yes, me uh, ask a, uh, a question here. Uh, are you hearing echo? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. Um, that being said, are you, this echo stone, does it meet the 50% minimum previousness uh, required by the lead credit heline effect? Uh, yes. That, and when we, we talked about that earlier, Richard, it is 100% uh, okay. previous. Now, in your uh, specifications or your product data sheet, does it list that? Um, How would someone know that it meets uh, the previousness of 50%? It, it would be in the description, I think, and uh, that uh, is pretty typical of all of the permeable interlocking pavers. Okay. That, again, regardless of the opening size, and that ranges from 8 to 14%, mm -hmm. uh, would be able to, is considered 100% pervious. Okay. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for for addressing that and making that point more clear. Uh, there are a number of different shapes. We're looking at one. Uh, the uh, uh, one on the screen is called Echo Stone. 
There are others. This is another shape that Ideal makes, but there are many, many other styles. Uh, permeable pavers, uh, typically you will find comply with the American Disabilities Act design guidelines for accessible paths of travel in that they are firm, stable, and slip and skid resistant. Um, most will have uh, a opening no greater than half inch that would allow a half inch steel sphere to penetrate through that opening. Uh, and of course, if the void is filled with aggregate, uh, that would not allow that to happen either. And if they are installed correctly, and uh, many manufacturers uh, will work with specifiers as well as the contractors on site to ensure that they are, uh, you should not experience any uh, vertical change in elevation that would exceed a quarter inch. Uh, the other aspect of the pavers is that they are factory made uh, and as such are delivered to a job site in uh, what we say a ready to use condition or use when ready condition and that would mean that uh, they are not bound uh, in e any type of climate, whether it be warm or a cold climate, um, to, a, to be installed during only a certain time of year. They are able to be installed uh, year-round. Uh, permeable pavers have the same uh, specification strength characteristics as our traditional pavers that many are familiar with. Uh, and that is they are made to meet or exceed ASTM 936, an 8,000 PSI minimum strength, a maximum absorption of 5%. Uh, because they are set on stone, uh, they are flexible, they can expand and accommodate movement without cracking. Uh, they can accommodate uh, a, any type of traffic very uh, heavy-duty traffic, uh, uh, large repetitive loads without cracking. Uh, they come in a choice of colors, uh, low maintenance, and easy to repair. If you ever need access to underground utilities for any reason, the pavers can be removed, set aside, and reinstated without any uh, appearance that a patch or the work has been performed. If we compare permeable pavement to uh, conventional pavement, we have an illustration on the screen that shows uh, traditional pavers that um, we say are impermeable. Uh, within a very short period of time, the runoff uh, becomes 100% horizontal. There is no infiltration through the surface of this type of a paver. It is set over a one to two inch layer of sand which is a C33, uh, uh, and that is placed over a compacted granular base uh, that is a varying thickness depending on the type of traffic, may be as minimal as 6 inches to as much as 14 inches. You will notice that it has edge restraint around it that needs to picture frame the pavers, uh, otherwise they are going to want to expand or walk sideways and, and resulting in rutting and defamation on the surface, which we certainly don't want that to occur. Contrast this to a permeable paver system, where we have the uh, pavers, as I described, with a percentage of ink that is filled with a material uh, that would be typically an ASTM number nine stone, which is similar to a, a quarter inch we do not want a uh, material that has any number uh, 200 uh, size that would pass a sieve on a 200 size. Uh, the course that it is set upon is what we would call the bedding course. That typically is a number 8 stone or 3 8 inch stone. And that is placed uh, at 1 to 2 inches thick. Um, and that is over the next layer, which is, uh, as you can see, is an open graded base reservoir. This will be typically four to six inches thick. It is an ASTM number 57 uh, or a three quarter inch stone. Now, on top of that is what we call, below that I should say, is the sub base. This is a open graded stone in ASTM number two 
which would be an inch and a half stone. And as you can see, we are uh, basically choking off each layer so that we will not lose uh, any of the stone as we construct uh, this cross section. And the thickness of that we will depend on the structural loading of the pavement as well as the hydrological uh, requirements which we will examine very shortly. Now pipe is typically put in and it's generally uh, determined as to how the water will be uh, exfiltrated out of that base. If it will go through the subgrade, we may not need the pipe. Uh, if we need assistance, then we will certainly need the perforated pipe. And that may be placed either at the bottom of the base or at some distance above it, depending upon um, certain factors on the site. Geotextile fabric, that is optional. And uh, it's typically used over weak or, or, or expansive uh, soils. Uh, it should be uh, always used on the sides of uh, permeable paver install, uh, installations, uh, and especially if it's an adjacent to a traditional uh, conventional pavement. And then we have the uncompacted subgrade soil. This is the soil, of course, that uh, Mother Nature has uh, left us. And, uh, Sometimes uh, it needs to be, or not sometimes, but clearly uh, careful thought needs to be given as to whether that subgrade soil will be compacted or not uh, because this will uh, change the ability of that to, uh, to accept water or receive water if it's going to exfiltrate into the subgrade. Okay, let yep. a reminder, you have five more minutes. Oh boy, okay, open graded aggregates. This is what it looks like, the ASTM number two and the number 57. And the upper pictures, the setting bed stone number eight on the lower left and the number nine stone, uh, the joint fill on the lower right. Uh, very quickly, uh, residential, uh, walkways, driveways, commercial entrances, uh, parking areas, uh, we saw one uh, taken nine years later, this is how it looks. Uh, large commercial parking lots, uh, colleges, universities. Uh, it does not have to be the entire pavement. Permeable pavement can receive uh, uh, run-on from conventional pavement, as you can see in the street design as well. Very quickly in the design, uh, we're going to look at the hydrological and structural design. We're going to analyze uh, the thickness required for each. For a structural analysis, we want to see what type of traffic it will take. And we'll look at uh, the thickness of what that base may be. For a pedestrian, it would be a minimum of six. Residential drives, 10 to 12. Parking lots and roads, much as 12 to 24. We'll need to look at the hydrological objectives of that pavement, and that will be looked at what the storm event is, how much rain and it will collect and store over a period of time. We'll calculate the amount of runoff, and typically for every inch of water, we're going to look for two and a half to three inches of base, and that's going to be designed for a 24 <coughs> to 48 hour storage. The final pavement thickness will be, once we know the structural loads, as well as the thickness for the amount of water to infiltrate, we will use the thicker of the two. So therefore, if structural requires 12 inches thick, hydrological 15 inches thick, the final thickness would be 15 inches. Now, where does it go? We need to look at the uh, infiltration rate of the subgrade soil, and that is determined typically by soil groups A, B, C, and D, because that will determine with and how we will design the pavement. If we have full exfiltration, it will exfiltrate through the subgrade. No pipes are needed. Partial exfiltration, we may need those pipes, and that could be placed at a varying height or on the base. If we have no exfiltration, such as water harvesting, uh, that would use a an impermeable liner, and then uh, we would certainly need those pipes to drain it. Design details, typically you may put an overflow drain, and if it has raised curbing, we would want a drainage swale that would either go into a grass swale 
adjacent to it or maybe into a bioretention cell. It can be used for slope sites where you would build a check dam uh, either into a slope or just step it down, as you can see, terracing. This can all be done through a software program by Permeable Design Pro, and construction is very similar to that of permeable, I mean, excuse me, traditional pavers where excavation the air, excavate the area, compact the subgrade as needed, place and compact the basin lifts, install edge restraints, the stone setting bed, place compact pavers, fill joints, repeat sweeping. A uh, number of tests have been done, Seneca College, Silver Lake, 57 inches per hour. Jordan Cove, I encourage everyone to Google this, a lot of good information, garnered over 10 years. Recently, UNH, for those in the Northeast, they have begun a two-year study. And uh, what's different here is we are not using the typical UNH-based design, but the two layers of that open graded stone that we mentioned earlier. Uh, permeable pavers contribute to lead. This is the U.S. Forest Service where it achieved a silver rating. This is in Compton, New Hampshire. And uh, permeable pavers contribute to a number of leads credits. I would encourage you to go on to ICPI via tech spec number 16. Uh, is a detailed specification that would walk you through and give you all the information. Maximizing long-term performance. Uh, permeable pavers can be cleaned. Uh, if clogging occurs, as you look in the lower right hand, uh, as I mentioned, it occurs in the top one inch, and you can see clear stone uh, clearly uh, that was just removed, and this can be maintained through normal conventional sweeping or totally clogged with a hydroback. Okay, uh, Larry, you're out of time. Do you want to just um, take a minute to wrap up? I will, I will, and that is the cost. Uh, it's very comparable to uh, conventional pavement, uh, and if you look at a cost comparison on a site in Illinois, uh, permeable pavers $10.95 a square foot, concrete 15, conventional concrete, asphalt 11.50. Uh, we say that it ranges in seven to twelve dollars per square foot. Uh, and that is for the pavers, the two-inch setting bed, the 12-inch base. Uh, on larger jobs with a uh, mechanically set, as you can see on the right of the screen, uh, we are looking at a much favorable pricing. You can be as low as $4.50 a square foot. So uh, there are limitations. It's for pedestrian and low-speed roadways. It requires greater site evaluation and certainly uh, demands a higher level of construction skills. You want to avoid certain areas with uh, porous pavements, drinking wells within 100-foot distance, high water tables, no closer than two, two uh, feet uh, from the surface of the bottom of the base, high bedrock or industrial sites. Uh, and certainly successes in the details uh, and just to wrap it, uh, the advantages are winter friendly, summer friendly, units can be removed, uh, pavers are easy to clean and maintain, they're available in SRI colors, uh, no cure time, they are traffic ready uh, and unaffected by tire shear. So uh, looking at this by simply changing the pavement surface and the base, we could basically have a built-in a uh, stormwater treatment system that can reduce and eliminate runoff pollutants and improve water quality. As we say, the stormwater solution is right under your feet. More okay. information can be gained from our website, which is shown on the site, on the screen, www.idealconcreteblock.com, or from ICPI, uh, fact sheets with heads, design manuals, and design software. For those who are in the area, we would also offer lunch and learn presentations, and uh, you can contact me directly. Uh, Richard, thank you, okay. and I apologize if I used any more time. <clears throat> That's okay. Uh, stay on with us. We'll, we'll have question and answering at the end. And uh, Brad, if you'd like to begin now. All right. Uh, I'll go ahead and start this. Uh, Larry did a good overview on some items that I'm going to run through very quickly. Um, bear with me. 
my slides aren't moving. There we go. Okay, uh, content, it's pretty self-explanatory, following Larry's uh, kind of table of contents and everything, so I'll just go to the next one. Okay, um, it's a little bit uh, different take on things and what uh, Larry had said about, uh, you know, one reason we, we want to do on-site stormwater control is because most developments, because of the impervious surfaces, they typically have a higher runoff rate than pre-development conditions for the most part, unless you're, uh, you know, doing uh, urban infill projects where you might already have a lot of impervious surfaces. And this shows a uh, post-development hydrograph of the kind of flow rates that you get in a post-development condition with lots of parking lots and impervious surfaces. And you can see you have a very quick time of concentration where you have a big slug of storm water that runs off. Traditionally, this is something that, uh, let's say in the first flush, the first three-quarter inch, half inch, three-quarter inch uh, storm flow, then gets into the uh, into the waterways and causes all sorts of problems downstream. Um, certainly you have to build expensive infrastructure to handle and possibly treat these on-site or off-site uh, uh, storm events. So one of the ways to take care of this is uh, something that is, is being used, which is low impact development strategies, uh, using the, the, uh, the ideas of on-site infiltration. And really one of the important things is designing and implementing what's called absorptive landscapes and also a porous hardscape. And these landscapes are there obviously to, uh, to contain that stormwater on site, use it to their, uh, to their advantage, and then infiltrate it back into the local soils and hopefully recharge the local groundwater table. It certainly helps filter out the pollutants. And like I mentioned, stormwater can be retained detained and treated or reused on site. In this case, the low impact development strategies that are out there, um, I'm sure most of you have heard about LID and how much it's becoming a driving factor in a lot of uh, new projects that are coming up for design review with public agencies. And you know, you have a conventional approach where really what you're doing is, is you're uh, conveying, you're containing, conveying piping and treating the, uh, the stormwater after it runs off the site. With the LID approach, the, uh, the goal is to try to contain it on site, use it beneficially in vegetation or what have you, maybe reuse it as a rainwater harvesting technique. But the whole thing is, is to retain it, attenuate it, and uh, make sure that if it does go to receiving waters that it's that it is high enough quality. There are many LID ordinances that are being implemented uh, now and definitely in the next five years. I don't think you're going to see any major uh, metropolitan area that doesn't have an LID ordinance uh, that will control um, you know, development, large developments, and their stormwater policy. Okay. Okay, now just one term I want to clarify on is, is uh, the difference between porosity or sustainable void space and permeability. A lot of times porosity and permeability get interchanged and uh, the reason I want to distinguish this is, is there's, uh, there's a term called sustainable void space that was developed by the University of Central Florida Stormwater Management Academy. And uh, what that porosity is, is it's the volume of the voids over the volume of the bulk. So it has no units, and it's usually from 0 0.01 to 0 0.50. So basically, in a 0 0.50, half of, the, uh, half of the bulk volume is voids, okay? And it can be easily measured. Permeability, to measure permeability, you have to be able to have a flux of fluid or a hydraulic gradient running through the porous system. So when you hear about pavement or you hear about uh, subsurface soils or, uh, or an aquifer and its permeability, you have to have a hydraulic gradient. You have to be able to have a fluid that runs from high to low. And so that's how you test for permeability. Um, you, to get a good permeability, you need a good porosity. But in some respects, having a high hydraulic gradient and, and uh, being able to, that, that relates to a higher permeability as well. 
So the sustainable void space measurement technique that the University of Central Florida has developed for porous pavements, uh, really what they're looking at is the long-term effect of porosity that's estimated after the permeability and infiltration testing has been done uh, following soil loading and pavement rejuvenation. And University of Central Florida, unfortunately, the, uh, the website did not come, come in on this slide, but it's www.stormwater.ucf.edu. I apologize it didn't show up on the slide. www.stormwater.ucf.edu. And they've been doing a lot of testing, just like University of uh, New Hampshire. And uh, they, they have some really interesting test results and a lot of master's theses that I encourage you to go look at regarding this. Long Brad, can I ask you the same question? Yeah. In the lead credit heat island effect on roof 7.1, are they referring to this sustainable void space when they say at least 50% pervious? Uh, no, normally what 50, at least 50% pervious means is you have an area, let's say your site area is, uh, let's say, 100,000 square foot. What they're talking about is that 50% 50 or 50,000 square foot of that area that's being, uh, let's say, in that case, mm -hmm. you're looking at a hardscape area. So let's say you have 100,000 square foot. At least 50,000 square foot of that must be a permeable surface. I see. And so, so the entire area. Yeah, correct. It's mm -hmm. more of an area assumption. Okay. okay. Yep. Very good. All right, All right, thank guys. you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, then in, into the next slide here. Hopefully it's taking a little time. Okay. Hard surface monolithic porous pavement options. Um, I just wanted to focus in on these monolithic porous pavements. Uh, there's really three different types. Larry had already mentioned porous asphalt and pervious concrete. But I also want to spend a lot more time on these new pavements that are out there called elastomeric resin bonded porous pavements. So what I mean by monolithic is, is these pavements are basically poured within uh, a monolithic structure with control joints or expansion joints as you need them. They are not uh, pre-manufactured or precast type pavement systems. So the first one that probably many people are aware of obviously is porous asphalt. Again, porous asphalt, as Larry had mentioned, is, is an, it has open pores because of a, an equal distribution of the coarse aggregate of, uh, in this case, this general mixed design data that I have. Um, about three-eighths of an inch, 55 to 75 percent is retained on a sieve. And you have a binder content of about six to six and a half percent by weight. Now that binder is obviously asphaltic. There's also some other um, chemicals that are added in there to help with the, uh, the adhesion to this coarse aggregate. Okay, and typically the air void content in this uh, general mix design uh, information that was developed through University of New Hampshire is 16 to 22 percent air void content using that ASTM standard. And you can see pictures uh, there with the open pore structure of the porous asphalt. Now the, the second and the most, probably the most common uh, porous monolithic surface is the pervious concretes. Again, it contains a similar sized aggregate, typically less than a half an inch with very minimal fines. Water cement ratios are normally about 0.35. There is special additives needed that normal structural concrete is not, uh, is not required for that. And again, it's to help, because this stuff is, is mixed at the ready mix uh, plant, you need to have a very uh, qualified ready mix uh, operator mix this and you need to be able to get it out to the job site quickly and installed quickly. This material has very low to no slump, and it must be installed typically by certified installers because the need to you know, have complete control over the finish and then subsequent curing. And this product is used by many, many people all over the world right now. And you can see uh, next to a surface uh, water body here in the upper picture, and then below it shows you a cross-section of the pervious concrete uh, overlying the drainage reservoir underneath it. And you can see it's got a cover on it, the plastic cover. It's probably just installed and is being cured. 
So uh, the, other, the other products I wanted to show you is these systems that are made out of elastomeric uh, resin binder. In this case, this product is called Firmapave. Uh, both the Firmapave and the next product called Filterpave are manufactured by Presto Geosystems out of uh, Wisconsin, who manufactures a bunch of other products, and they're also a subsidiary of Reynolds Packaging, um, so they're a fairly large company. And the other uh, partner in this is BASF. Everybody knows about BASF and their chemicals, and in this case, their elastomeric binding agents that they've uh, perfected for this product. What it is basically is, in this case, the Firmapave is a natural stone aggregate that's encapsulated in a polyurethane binder. It has the highest sustainable void space, again, we're talking about sustainable void space, of any hard surface monolithic pavement. Uh, you can see right there, 48% is what has been measured at the University of Central Florida. The basic color is similar to a decomposed granite trail, and it also comes in red and blue colors. Um, it has a low embodied carbon footprint because you're not having to manufacture any cementitious uh, materials, and it's got a lower carbon footprint with the elastomeric binders. And then you can use reclined aggregate if it's feasible after doing the proper bench testing. So you, uh, with that, I'm going to go to the next one, and I'll show you some installation pictures and other information about this. The other uh, material that's elastomeric is used uh, recycled glass, and it's called filter pave. Again, it's manufactured by Presto Geosystems with a partnership with BAS, and it utilizes 100% post-consumer recycled glass. And you can see in the pictures the glass shards that are usually beer bottles and wipes uh, are crushed down to a certain specific gradation. You can see that uh, you know people. You certainly are. It's uh, you can walk in this stuff and put your hands in it. It doesn't cut you. Um, again, it is bound by that same bio-based polyurethane binder protected by BASF, and uh, it's got about five different color options. And because it's the shiny glass material, it's very aesthetically pleasing. Has a really high surface reflectance index. Um, and so that's good for, obviously, the heat island effect. And they do place a UV stabilizing top coat after the monolithic pavement has been installed. The sustainable void space has been measured, again, at 39%, so it's not quite as big as, uh, as high as the Firmapave, but it's still pretty substantial. And again, as mentioned before, a relatively low embodied carbon footprint. So and I'll show you some additional information about these systems here in a second. Okay, uh, the elastomeric recycled rubber called FlexiPave, you know, some people might be familiar with this, it's manufactured by KBI out of Florida, and I believe this product was originally intended at one point you know, for track and field tracks and also playgrounds, and uh, basically it's using another elastomeric binder and uh, again, you have a relatively low embodied carbon footprint. There's also five color options. And the sustainable void space is about 20%, so it is less than the other elastomeric pavements. Um, they report a very high flexibility, of course, it's using recycled, 100% uh, post-consumer recycled rubber. So you're going to have very high flexibility, you're not going to have cracking, and there's been long life activity reported by KBI. And you can see three applications here, trails, and then also in a parking, uh, parking lot as well. Okay, so some design considerations. I'm shifting over to pretty much all different types of monolithic pavement options. Again, uh, porous pavement is going to be two and a half to eight inches thick, depending on the application. There's going to be a choker course that's normally put right below it. The reservoir rock uh, is below that, and you have thicknesses of six to 36 inches, depending on the situation, the design considerations, and then you have your underlying soil, which typically most municipalities, they're looking at a minimum of a half an inch to two, two inches an hour infiltration rate. So some of the considerations you need to think about is, first, you've got to review that owner's project requirement. I know most people are kind of used to hearing about an OPR because of the lead uh, situation, but any project should have a written owner's project requirement, regardless of whether it goes for lead. There should be a narrative together. 
And because of this low impact development ordinances that are coming up, the owners are going to owners and developers are going to have to think about these these items, which is, do they want to harvest and reuse the rainwater? Does it want to be infiltrated into underlying soils? Is there a hybrid or combination? And then last but not least is, are they attempting LEED certification or some other uh, different type of uh, green building rating system? Brad, um, is infiltration? Uh, yeah, sorry, a uh, quick reminder. Uh, you have five minutes. Uh, okay, very good. Thanks, no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, is infiltrated, infiltration needed because of an LAD ordinance? I already mentioned that. Um, and then hydraulic considerations. You have to have a civil engineer, a professional civil engineer involved to design these infiltration rates and uh, in specifications. And lastly is will it be installed on slopes? Larry had shown that before is the, the idea of having check dams in there if you're on slopes. Um, structural considerations. Are you going to drive on it? You know, H10 to H20 loading, typically the, all these pavements will be able to handle that. A lot of times the building code official wants to see 90 to 95 percent compaction. Well, if, you, if you're trying to get 90 to 95 percent compaction, then you lose your infiltration rates below the pavement. So that's not a good thing. Climate considerations, freeze, thaw, hot, humid weather. As mentioned before, porous asphalt does not work well in hot, humid weather because there is the potential for the binder to flow and, and um, close up all the pores. Some pavement systems are not good with freeze-thaw either, so you have that. And then lastly is your maintenance considerations. Um, if your porous pavement area is adjacent to a sediment runoff area, it's going to likely be clogged a lot more, so you have to step up your maintenance rates. Okay. And here's an example of a really good maintenance system. This is actually University of New Hampshire. They use it, and it's a regenerative air direct vacuum system that they recommend. And, you know, again, maintenance is, it, uh, I hate to say this, but it's, it, it depends how often you need to do the maintenance rate. It really is a, it's a site-by-site site site, uh, situation depending on how much in the way of solid loading or if you have um, other things regarding tree detritus and things like that that can, that can decompose and clog things up. For some reason, my slides aren't moving anywhere. Matt? Okay. okay. Yeah, here we go. Okay, specifications. So here's some ideas, and I'll run through this very quickly. It, these slides are here for, uh, you know, for you all to come back and look through this. But, you know, again, there's these specifications for pervious concrete. There are these sources of information, including the whole building design guide that has uh, information on porous paved. And then underneath is the underlying drainage materials, ASHTO 57, ASHTO 3. What if it's a green book spec that you're using crushed concrete? to help boost your recycled content. You know, is that going to meet the requirements that the civil engineer has, uh, has put aside? Next slide. And here's some examples of three different design specifications for porous asphalt, for pervious concrete, and then filter pave, the uh, recycled glass aggregate. Next. And here's some installations of, uh, of per, in this case, porous asphalt on the left, pervious concrete on the right. Again, with these products, you have to be very careful. Oops, you have to be very careful with um, with making sure that you're not compacting the surfaces too much because you don't want to create that clogging um, as it's being uh, as it's being installed and then cured later. So here's, uh, and you can see they use a roller type system. With filter pave, okay, go ahead, next one. With filter pave, what you have to look at is the quality control that's done on site. Um, you know, per, 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 pervious asphalt or porous asphalt, a lot of quality control is done on site. Most of the quality control for mixes and everything with porous concrete is done at the ready mix plant. With filter pave, you do everything on site. So you have to have tight quality control of mixing the resins and the aggregates together. So there is a quality control document that can be easily downloaded. Next slide. So here's examples of looking at the filter pave installation. Here we're preparing the base, which is the stone reservoir, let's say an ashtone number three, and then the choker course goes on top of that. Next. 
And you can see there's also a filter fabric there, too. Here's the volumetric mixer that's used for filter pave, which uh, the glass aggregates dropped into the hopper, and then it comes through a volumetric mixer on the back with the resins mixed in. And then that can be dumped right into a, a skip loader like this. And you can see it right here being dumped onto the prepared um, subgrade. Next. Okay, Brad, uh, your yeah. time's up, so if you can uh, okay. wrap up your Very good. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, we'll just run through these really quickly. A mobile buggy material transport. If you've got trails, you can move this material out using a mobile buggy. There they are screeding. Next. Uh, here's a parking stall screed and finishing with the uh, firma pave. Here's a large parking lot. And the kind of rates you can get with the installation, an example was uh, they just project up in Toronto where they did 27,000 square foot in a parking lot in five and a half days with the recycled glass filter pave. Now here's this estimated installation costs are somewhat similar to Larry except that uh, what I did was probably on the preparation side of the reservoir and the choker course I'm a little low on the prices but basically this shows you preparation material installation post installation and total cost and you can see that the material, of course, with the elastomeric system is going to be more than concrete and asphalt. Uh, the installations, a little bit more on the elastomeric. Post-installation is going to be less on the elastomeric because it doesn't crack and you don't have as much potential for patching. And with asphalt, you always have to do seal coats over time. And so the total costs come out around uh, anywhere from $7 to uh, $12, or in this case, uh, this is going to be anywhere from around $10 to $15 a cost uh, a square foot when you include preparation in there. Next slide. And here's a comparison table of design lives and everything. Uh, again, one of the advantages to the recycled glass aggregate is it's 96% post-consumer. So you actually get a lead content value of around five to $6,000 an acre. Uh, of material that's installed, so that, that can be quite nice uh, if you're going for big lead points. And uh, next slide. And here's the final takeaways. Uh, hard surface monolithic porous pavement is a viable BMP for on-site infiltration. Uh, one thing you need to do is use experienced stallers as these mixes are more difficult to maintain, finish, and cure than a traditional pavement. You need to specify job-specific requirements into the standard specifications. The elastomeric porous pavement is growing in acceptance and in most instances has a much lower embodied carbon footprint. And then hard surface monolithic porous pavements will work with quality mix installation and also that long-term commitment to maintenance. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, one question for each speaker and then uh, we'll put it to the audience. Um, Brad, do you see in the next version of LEED 2012 that these new products, previous concrete asphalt and the elastometric aggregate, as being uh, acceptable options? Um, I think it's going to be, I doubt, you know, like anything with LEED, uh, you know, with U.S. Green Building Council, when they put these out, they don't necessarily endorse a specific product. Sure. And normally in the past they've called it, I guess, open cell pavement or whatever their, their traditional, open grid. yeah, open grid mm -hmm. pavement. And I think what What's happening is whether or not LEED drives it, you know, as an advantage to using these, I think just the low impact development is. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, for instance, out here at City LA that they're developing theirs right now, they, they basically have the number one, um, the, the, the first tier of, of, uh, of, of mitigation of on-site stormwater infiltration. So mm -hmm. I think what you're going to have is you're just it's going to be it's going to be driven by local building codes, and uh, and also because uh, permeable pavements are just less costly when you have to put in the money for all the stormwater handling infrastructure. Mm -hmm. They really sure. in, a, in a life cycle. So sure. And Larry, uh, you mentioned ICPI software. Is that available to designers and professionals? Uh, yes, it is, and uh, you can either contact ICPI or, or your local um, manufacturer of uh, pavers. Mm -hmm. Okay, Matt, is there any questions for the audience? I know we ran over a little bit. We have four minutes for um, yep. questions. There is one question here from Edith um, asking, I think for both of you actually, um, since it is a pervious material, um, how are the oil and other hazardous material, materials that may penetrate below the surface 
taking care of. Mm. Good one. You want um, me to start with that, Larry, or you want to start? Uh, j just briefly, um, if it's a small amount of oil, such as drippings, um, typically uh, microbes in the in the base will uh, will biodegrade those. Uh, on larger spills, it certainly will not. However, what it does do is contain them. Mm. So therefore, it minimizes the environmental hazard and certainly the cleanup costs, uh, rather than running over a uh, a uh, impervious uh, pavement down into a storm catch basin or into a receiving body adjacent to it, uh, it's it's a safer in terms of, of that. Okay, Brad? Um, I would say also just to, uh, you know, the pervious pavements, what they do is, is they create, as, as Larry's mentioned, a biofilm for for bacteria, for microbes to, you know, kind of live down there. Uh, in the in the porous structure, um, and not only about oil and grease. I mean, if you have if you have pure oil and grease product, it is going to contain it. But if you have dissolved constituents, oil and grease, likely the microbes are going to get to that because there's air, there's oxygen and water traveling through the system, and that uh, there there has been studies that have shown that there is a there is some fractional treatment that's done also with nitrogen and phosphorus. University of Central Florida has done tests, and I think University of New Hampshire is as well. And uh, one thing that's interesting about those elastomeric pavements is uh, the filter pave, uh, the, in the filter pave just did get a patent for, um, for treatment of, um, of contaminated stormwater. Through through the elastomeric pavement because of the urethane, it has a little bit more affinity for chemical reaction with the uh, with the with the contaminant. So Great. More, more information is going to come out of that in the future. Great. Okay, Matt. I see we only have one more minute. Uh, should we uh, close the session now? And I thank uh, both speakers for joining us. Sure. At this point, we don't have any other questions, and okay. no hands appear to be raised. So I think we are good to go for the day. Okay. Uh, thank you both, Larry and Brad. Uh, they were two very good perspectives. Um, <clears throat> I like the uh, the different aspects that you brought up to the uh, presentation, and hopefully the audience um, learned a lot from uh, this topic.